to start out with a quote from Jack Kerouac that I ran across. I, I didn't know it was true to Don't call people on the phone. Nobody's ready to answer the phone. Use poetry. It's a direct quote. This is another one that has been resonating in my head. I'm going to get on to this, but nobody in this room can ignore. Pity this busy monster mankind not. Progress is a comfortable disease. Your victim, death, and life, and safety beyond. Plays with the bigness and littleness. Electronics defy one razor blade we have in our pocket into a mountain range, and lenses extend on wish the curving where within till unwish returns unto itself. A world made is not a world born, pity poor flesh, and trees and poor stars and stones, but never, never this fine specimen of hyper magical cyberstein omnipotence. We doctors know a hopeless case if we see one. Listen, if there's a hell of a good universe next door, let's go. No. E. E. Cummings. Excuse the bar napkins. I can never figure out what to read. Um, so I end up bar napkins in. This is uh, dedicated to somebody who really should be remembered here on the Lower East Side, Bob Holman. Bob Holman did more during the 90s and the 80s to promote this that has happened. Uh, and personally, he was very, very kind to me. And he always said, if you don't know what to do, read the other poem. <laughs> Poet gets up in front of uh, an indifferent skeptical audience, they air ball him like his fly is open. And then there's toilet tissue stuck to the heel of his uh, shoe as he starts to stammer out a few lines of verse and they can see his hand shaking and somebody from the back goes, no, don't read that poem again tonight. Read the other poem. Poet lowers his papers and peers out to the collective shadows and goes, you mean the one I have in my hand isn't any good? I mean, how do you know? I haven't even gotten a few words out of my mouth yet. <laughs> Always willing to try and please, Poet shuffles his papers and starts to read the one about being an uninvited walk-on stranger in an unfamiliar city facing a small literary clique is making him sweaty and feel unworthy of their omnipotent consideration and is wondering just what the fuck is up with who the hell thought it could possibly be a good idea to run this dude up here and then the whispers start. He doesn't have it. He doesn't have it. He doesn't have the other poem. We, we can tell. Look at the way he's shaking. He doesn't know it. Poet stares down his own lines that are written like they were from a moron imposter and goes, why did I pick this one? <laughs> okay, should I try the love poem about struggling across an ocean of sand to see you again? <laughs> Maybe the political one about the confederacy of dunces running this dog and pony show election into the ground. Or maybe the carefully designed sonnet, rendered in complete quatrains, foreshadowing some cryptic fear that only the poet understands. Audience begins to get a little pissed. With what little attention span they possess, they start burning up his verbal currency in a fireball of crossed arms, impatient stares, and I told you so's, knowing glances. An instant dismissal is all but decided upon. Dude doesn't have it. He doesn't know the other poem. Poet digs in his heels up there and figures, oh, what the fuck? Here you go. I found this in the Inquirer. 
<laughs> Somewhere hidden behind our nation's capital is a military fortification known only as Level X. Constructed during the Reagan administration with a time travel dog from the future who is being held captive. In the year 2048, highly evolved canines are fighting with man for independence. Escaping from their own time, this quadrifigure doghouse timeline machine must melt with a heart, a mutt with a conscience has returned to our time to warn us and try to avert a terrible civil war between man's and man's best friend. The dog's name is Hind Leg. He stands a little over five feet tall, dressed in a silver jumpsuit and black boots. He has sharp claws, sharper teeth, and a rather bemused, sad expression. Well, it looks kind of sad. It's hard to tell. My name, he says, is Hind Leg. Not that it means anything to you, and this is my story. Centuries of domestication allowed us to evolve into a higher life form. While humans were becoming more and more dependent upon technology, we canines were staying fit and honing our minds, chasing cars, and doing tricks for you. Our masters for centuries on Earth here were hard to please with you. We were your friends. Fetch, roll over, play dead. But we grew weary of the servitude. We bided our time and let you run the show run our planet with your foolish ignorance. You shoot. That's all you do is shoot. You shoot in church. You shoot in nightclubs. You shoot in the street. You shoot each other. You shoot at lovers. You never met a trigger you didn't like. And we're afraid of the one trigger that somebody is going to get their hands on. And that's going to be the end of our kennel. It's going to the end of all of us. Far too long we have been treated like stray mutts in the poetry, doghouse, of your limited imagination, of your literary society that kept us chained up in the yard in all types of weather. We are our options reduced to stand or fight, beg or bark. And then hind leg fell silent. He refused to speak any further. I'm afraid the future of mankind on earth was curbed forever. Dude from the back of the room gasped, do you call that a poem? And I go, not really, but wait till the cats get here. They're really pissed. I taught in a correctional facility outside of the um, jail for 17 years. GED instructor in basic literacy. It was not the big house, it was the little house. George Raft will not appear. This is a Stan Mack home. This happened. It's called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. On a June Saturday morning, I walk into the booking room to get today's updated alpha list for the GED students for the cell block assignments, and there's a semi-naked inmate clad in an adult diaper in the rubber room screaming at me from behind a plexiglass every time I walk by the copier. He's screaming at me, hey, 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 you, you, you. Now, I know the correct procedure in this situation. No eye contact, no acknowledgement. But he's in there for a reason, so am I. So I just pass him by on the way out, and he starts screaming at me again. Hey, you, doctor, doctor, doctor. <laughs> and again, I'm, I'm just passing through here and headed out the door. And as I go, he goes, fuck you. <laughs> I walk down the long, sterile corridors thinking, like in Orwell, but I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one in the jail. I'm, I'm a teacher here. And immediately starts singing the Mr. Rogers song. And I can do this. After all, he was the one drinking antifreeze. <laughs> he was, too. All right. I gotta get these out of this one, small points. Bob, real short. Hey Murph, new law for Murphy. Quattrochi's postulate. If you're looking for something specific, you'll never find it. But while digging in all that crap, you'll run across any number of things you didn't want, and furthermore, never wanted to have to look at again. <laughs>
Janet, Marie, who read the the um, the salacious the sailboat piece? story? Yeah, Marie. 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 Salacious. Marie, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I met you before. Twenty five. Sail. But you don't get the point. This is called uh, Cunnilingus Interruptus. She was laid out, mostly naked, with her legs spread apart, propped up on pillows, and I was dead center in between the middle, giving her head. I like it. I like doing it. I've been told I'm pretty good at it. My technique centers around a million tiny feathery kisses, schools, rather than the St. Bernard lapping from flavor it needs to be worked up to. The way I look at it, the entire act is very ironic, like trying to get back into the womb head first the way you came out, only in the opposite direction. True, it, it's very much like trying to enter the place that has a no entry sign clearly posted on the door. So I'm working away on her, she starts to reach for the remote control on the TV on the dresser at the end of the bed, change the channel on one of those grizzly anti-cigarette PSAs. She says, I hate that. I raise my eyebrows and I look at her. She says, oh no, not you, you're doing just fine. <laughs> Do you see my cigarettes? You don't mind if I smoke, do you? Helps me relax. Okay by me, I reply. So she lights up. A few minutes later, I say, you know, I'm hungry. Can we take a quick break for a few seconds? Gets up, pads in the kitchen with one of her V T-shirts, one of mine. I watch that sweet bare ass bounce out of the room. I lay back up, looking at the ceiling, waiting. She returns to a sandwich, resumes her previous position, and I head back to work a little more determined this time. Mmm, <laughs> she goes. So good. Great, I think. I'm making real progress. Here. And then she announces, God, oh God, yum, I love this German bologna with white bread with mayo. <laughs> the next, you know, the next thing I hear, of course, is the prompter for cell phone. She reaches for it and flips it open. Mind if I take this call? It's, it's from work and it's probably pretty important. The conversation ensues. It's rather lengthy and one-sided from the other end. And then I hear her go, oh. 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 And I'm thinking, bingo. Now I have her on the edge of the clit cliff. And then I hear her saying, oh, okay, now I get it. We'll handle that son of a bitch first thing Monday morning. We need to get after this. Bye now. There's a silence for a few minutes. And I'm working into a crescendo, and she lets out a long, deep sigh. And I go, at last, friggin' pay dirt. She leans upright knocks me on the head with her knuckles and says, I'm sorry, you're very sweet, and all this is very nice, but it's just not working right now. And when I'm pulling on her robe, shrugging it, it's just not going anywhere tonight with this. You're just not doing it right. You have to concentrate more. You have no power of concentration. <laughs> and then from the other room, I hear the computer being turned on. I lay back, looking at the ceiling. <laughs> short ones. I like short poems and as I've told people before, short poems are very cool because if they're good, you like them because they're fast and if they're bad, you like them because they're over. So, <laughs> if I can find the right ones. Phil says I have a minute so the clock is ticking. <clears throat> okay, I even know this one by heart. Um, entitlement self-esteem and uh, poor poor feelings about self. No, an erection does not count as personal growth. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, I will rather. This is another, this, is, this one's right from the Daily News. Those clowns in Midtown. Police report reads two white Caucasian males in costume aggressively attempting to entertain riders on the A train into Times Square by suggesting they eat peanuts out of a bowl. 
Thank you. <laughs> Your gender shovel. The last man who knew how to do anything died yesterday. He remains unburied. Seemed nobody remembered what to do next. <laughs> except her. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wall Street Journal Classified 2014 found one conscience. Like new, hardly used. Lost. One heart. Yeah, I know it's broken, but I want it back. <laughs> <laughs>